dishing them out and getting them right back. A CTV News investigation exposing the number of speeding tickets issued to Toronto police. The figure catching some by surprise and what happens when a vehicle is found going too fast. Good evening. The numbers are the result of a Freedom of Information request. Police vehicles fined more than 1,000 times for speeding and red light violations in a two-year period. CTV John Woodward is live with our top story. John, what do the tickets tell you? Nathan, the tickets which are issued through uh, pictures taken by the machines like the one behind me show us where and when police vehicles are uh, speeding or running red lights. They are allowed to do those sorts of things in emergencies, but those aren't the situations that we see in a lot of these tickets. The 30 kilometer an hour speed limit sign in this photo is just a suggestion to this officer who was ticketed $85 for going 13 over. This special constable ticketed $120 for zooming 59 kilometers an hour in a 40 zone right next to Gulf Road Junior Public School as school buses picked up students. The tickets among hundreds obtained from the Toronto Police Service by CTV News through a Freedom of Information request as Toronto's finest faced fines from the city's automated speed and red light cameras. Police are allowed to speed in emergencies. What might have happened on Lawrence Avenue is this cruiser follows an ambulance through a red light. Or when this car got a $634 ticket for going 92 in a 50 zone. But there aren't a lot of parking emergencies. This parking enforcement car was ticketed $227.50 for going 65 in a 40 zone on Renforth Drive. Tickets show the same vehicle was dinged two days later. City data also obtained by CTV News shows some patterns. 1,038 automated speeding tickets were written to police vehicles in Toronto over a 26-month period, or about five tickets every four days. In that time period, they got 164 red light tickets as well. According to the data, the most number of speeding tickets at any spot, 55, were issued at Beverly Street and Darcy Street, a few blocks west of 52 Division. The largest number of tickets issued for running red lights was 23 at Warden Avenue and Ellesmere Road. The tickets to police vehicles, just a fraction of the hundreds of thousands of tickets the machines issue each year. But road safety at the TPS is not just a theoretical issue. The SIU are investigating after a cyclist was struck and seriously injured by a Toronto police cruiser earlier this month. Police said the cruiser was responding to a call. The thought of police officers who are paid to uphold public safety are in fact endangering public safety to the extent that they are speeding casually past speed cameras. That is, uh, that's not good. A possible close call here. This ticket shows a pedestrian was in the intersection when this cruiser ran the red at Spadina and King Street. The TPS pays these tickets up front, but says it frowns on unnecessary speeding, saying professional standards determines which unit the vehicle is from and notifies that unit's complaints coordinator, who will then conduct an investigation to determine if an exemption is justified. If the coordinator determines there was no justification, prescribed hours would be docked from the officer's pay as a penalty. The most recent data show automated tickets issued to the police actually rose from 435 in 2021 to 495 in 2022, worrying critics who saw the force get millions more in last week's city budget. Obviously, they've got to look at what what system do they have for dealing with these tickets and they've got to change it. But they say these machines offer more accountability than when it was only the police writing these tickets. So while we were trying to track these tickets, we FOI'd the city as well as the police, and the numbers we got back from each side were different. The city had issued more tickets than the police actually acknowledged. And so when you look at that from, from some of these critics' perspectives, they're wondering if enough is being done to track these officers who are speeding when they don't need to. Reporting live, I'm John Woodward. Nathan, back to you. All right. Thank you, John. Meanwhile, parking enforcement officers are on the job today, a change from what many have expected on holidays. If you didn't remember to pay for your spot, you may have learned your lesson the hard way. CTV Scott Lightfoot is live with us now. And Scott, did you pay for your parking today? I walked, so I'm good, but we did pay for the truck here, yes. You know, curb space is at a premium here in this city, and that's why a courtesy that drivers have been extended on statutory holidays in the past ends as of today. From now on, on legal holidays, you will have to pay for parking if you park on city streets. It is a holiday purchase some, like Sam Spatero, would rather not be paying. Usually you don't pay for this holiday, but you know, I figure I'll come down and pay anyway. What he and other drivers were paying for today was parking. 
today is, you know, historically in Toronto on stat holidays, we would not be enforcing the on-street paid parking, but today that changes. Just so you know, okay? <laughs> Starting with this family day holiday, on-street paid parking bylaws will be enforced by parking enforcement officers across the city. If you're used to, you know, coming downtown or anywhere in the city where there's paid parking enforced and on a holiday, you know, usually you would have a freebie and you wouldn't have to pay. And now you are to pay. And if not, you could be subjected to a parking ticket. According to the city, reasons for this change include increased competition for curb space with streetcar corridors, bike lanes, cafe TO patios, and other infrastructure. It's always just a operational decision. It was never actually like in the bylaws that we are to not enforce on a statutory holiday. So now with the city changing and more demand for curbside parking, the Toronto Police Service is the one who has decided to make this operational change and to begin enforcing on street paid parking. Some drivers today almost caught unaware of the changes. There, there's already park enforcement coming to uh, ticket the cars, but we got we got it just in time just to pay for the tickets. So now we, now we save ourselves a few bucks. Yeah, I think he was a nice guy. Others not impressed, having to pay to park on a holiday. Wrong thing the city's doing. Makes people not come to Toronto. Now we did see some tickets handed out today, but parking enforcement officers have the uh, discretion to ticket or not ticket, so you may get a warning. They do want to get the message out that this will be standard practice going forward on legal holidays from here on out. Pointing live downtown, I'm Scott Light, but Andrea, back to you. Thank you, Scott. Walk carefully there. Still ahead, a family devastated how an airline lost a loved one's asses. Pat Ford with the details in just a few minutes. But first, a live look outside on this Monday evening. Today was chilly, but mainly clear across southern Ontario. Certainly much more seasonal compared to earlier in the month. And we also had some sunshine. Michelle mm. is here with a look at the current conditions. Hey, Michelle. Hi, Nathan. Yes, sunshine in abundance, especially earlier in the day. A little bit more cloud cover later on, but really not a bad day at all, as long as you were bundled up to get outside and enjoy some winter activities. As we look at our satellite and radar imagery now, you can see we have more cloud cover here in the GTA, extending up towards the Upper Great Lakes. A little bit of flurry activity as well that has been popping up along the lakeshore, uh, extending it towards Durham region, also uh, for Muskoka region and over towards Barrie and Aurelia. So be aware of that. Otherwise, we're looking at mainly clear conditions through the overnight, or I would say just a few clouds here and there. Winds are out of the west, 11 kilometers an hour. That's probably enhancing that snowfall off of the lake and western edges of, uh, or east of the city of Toronto, I should say. Minus three feeling like minus seven at the moment as we get through the overnight period, minus nine feeling like minus 11. And that's how it will feel first thing in the morning. So you'll want to bundle up, but I will let you know that we're going to be a little bit milder for the next few days again before we dip into cooler air yet again. So Andrea, I'll let you know how that plays out in the full forecast. Back to you. Thanks, Michelle. Two shootings in two days. There is a sense of fear in a North York neighborhood tonight. Gun violence once again front and center. Extreme violence, increasing anxiety levels. The weekend bloodshed particularly brutal. CTV's Beth McDonnell is live with more. Beth. Nathan, this command post behind me has been set up in the Driftwood Community Centre parking lot. Officers are here to help community members access counselling and provide safety as many are feeling anxious. On horseback and around the Jane and Driftwood neighbourhood, Toronto police are working to bring a sense of safety back after two brazen shootings at bus stops in just 24 hours. Uh, we know the community is definitely alarmed, and, uh, and so are we. As a presence and to help anyone trying to cope with the violence, officers have set up a command post. They are also out in their cruisers. While investigators say the shootings have the hallmarks of gang activity, they can't confirm, and so far they appear to be random. Right now it's about making sure the community that's here that feels safe, uh, the community and the specific families that have been impacted, providing them the support that they need. This college student left home shortly after the first shooting Friday evening around 6 when a 16-year-old boy was shot in the face. That bus stop is steps from his door. I would say you know what, everyone's at risk because the person's at large. Definitely a lot of cops being around gives people that, you know, sense of safety. Also, I will say, yeah, command center is good, but also like bus stops. Roommates Anna and Maria live close to the second shooting. This one Saturday at 3 in the afternoon. The victim, a man shot three times in the stomach and head. He died. It's very scary and also I also take the bus a lot. And right now wherever I'm going, I'm walking. It's just crazy because one after another, you know, 
It's just really, really crazy. They, along with others, are relieved police officers are here. It's the kind of reassurance Chanel Jones, who also lives in the community, would like to see more often. I feel police presence would make me feel more safe here, especially like evening times. I try not to be out at, like around here and it shouldn't be that way in your own neighborhood. Um, so yeah, I think the presence is needed. Yeah. Police say the command post is open around the clock for the foreseeable future. Tonight, police say there is no suspect description. They do hope to have visuals available soon, along with an update on this investigation. Police are asking people, anyone who has seen a black Acura with the RDX of the model to contact police. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Now back to the station. All right, thank you, Beth. Next to the grim discovery west of Toronto, a man's body found in a burned out garage in Guelph. CTV Stephanie Davis has more on the investigation. A heavy emergency presence on Hands Drive in Guelph Sunday evening. Smoke seen billowing out of a home's double garage doors. The fire came in through a 911 call at 5.37 p.m. last night. Uh, we had multiple calls. Several trucks and other emergency vehicles responded and crews were able to put out the fire quickly. The investigation still in its early stages, but fire officials confirming it started in the garage. The fire did not breach outside the garage and most of the house is totally fine other than minor smoke damage. As firefighters searched the rest of the home, a man was found with what police are describing as serious injuries. He was brought to Guelph General Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. The fire department saying his injuries were unrelated to the fire. The fire did not cause the injuries that the person that was deceased sustained. And as such, the fire marshal's office is not coming to investigate it. And it's going to be investigated by Guelph Fire Prevention, and the cause is still under investigation. In a statement Monday, Guelph police say, quote, at this time it is believed the fire was deliberately set. No arrests have been made as part of the investigation and police say no suspects are being sought. The fire department says no vehicles were inside the garage when the fire broke out. Stephanie Davis, CTV News. Next to what's been a deadly season for snowmobile enthusiasts in Ontario. At least a dozen people have died in incidents across the province. CTV's Austin Lee reports. A tragic snowmobile collision near Renfrew that claimed the life of a 29-year-old woman and sent a 33-year-old man to hospital with critical injuries came as a shock to Mark Diot. Devastating to, to hear that. Um, uh, we haven't had that kind of incident on our trails that I can recall. The crash happened Saturday afternoon on a trail that had just opened up in the township of McNabb Brayside. It's maintained by the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs. The driver was pronounced dead on the scene while the passenger is still in hospital fighting for his life. The next day, about 120 kilometres outside of Kingston, another rider crashed into a tree and was thrown from their vehicle. They were airlifted to hospital with serious injuries. Up to this point in our season, we've had barely any snow. Uh, we had a very mild winter. So I think we're seeing more people out on their snowmobiles right now. Um, more people are taking risks with the temperature fluctuations on the ice as well. Some of the new snowmobiles have more power than small cars, and that means they can reach top speeds exceeding 180 kilometres per hour, far beyond the trail speed limits of 50 kilometres per hour. Most of the areas you've seen these are on uh, old railway beds, and these are great for trails. They're very smooth, very, very smooth corners, but they do encourage people to go faster than they probably should go. And depending on the experience of the person, they may not really be able to handle that. Police are still investigating exactly what led to Saturday's fatal collision near Renfrew. Austin Lee, CTV News. It's now been exactly one year since the family of Ron Peterson learned of his stabbing death in downtown Barrie. The healing continuing for those he's left behind. CTV's Mike Arcelides reports on how loved ones are honoring their father. We miss him and love him so much. And not a day goes by where we don't think about him, you know, like not a day. The Schneider family is still trying to make sense of Ron Peterson's death a year ago on family day. You don't have to be with your family for it to be family day to still remember them and be with them, but it's definitely harder when they're not here. 
It's here along Collier Street in downtown Barrie where the life of Ron Peterson, also known as Ron Brennan, was taken. The 47-year-old Barrie husband, father and grandfather died when family members say he was stabbed on the street and later sought help in a nearby Dunlop Street restaurant. He was a big part of the community. Everyone really, it really hurt everybody when he wasn't here anymore. His family says Ron, who struggled with his own demons, was a leader and protector for those battling homelessness and addiction. His death, they say, leaves a gaping hole in his family and those whose lives he made better. No matter what your family is going through, whether it's addiction, homelessness, mental health, just a hard time, maybe they lost their job. I mean, you need to reach out and understand that when you are in a hard time, you are still a person who is full of feelings and love and capable of giving to others and just reach out and tell them that you love them and you're proud of them no matter what choices they've made because when they do make those choices it's not because they don't love you it's because they don't love themselves. The men accused of his murder remain behind bars. The allegations against them have not been tested in court. Ron's family wishing he was here with them today reminding others this family day to cherish what they have before it's gone. Oh, I just want him to know that we're okay, but we miss him. You don't want to have regret for not seeing them and making them feel worse. You know, you just, you need to see them because they might not be here tomorrow. Ron's family inviting anyone who would like to honor him or those who are in their hearts and on their minds this family day to join them by the South Shore Centre on Tuesday night from 5 to 7, where they plan to release lanterns and balloons for those who are gone, but not forgotten. Mike Arsleady, CTV News, Barry. There's an urgent call for action as the number of Ontario seniors is growing faster than the general public. A new report says that will soon put massive pressure on the province's already strained health care system. CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver reports. Across Ontario, many emergency departments are already in crisis, and that is expected to get worse unless thousands of health care workers are hired to help seniors stay in their homes. We need to pay attention because these are the folks who will need so much care from the health care system. And any part of the care that is uh, higher than home care is very, very expensive. Within the next six years, Ontario's over 65 population is expected to grow by 650,000 people, as those over 75 grows by 350,000. To maintain current service levels, a new report estimates Ontario alone needs to hire at least 6,800 more personal support workers. Caregivers are burning out. Uh, it is a real systemic issue, and that's why we have to make sure we build up our home care system so that we can avoid all of that stress on, on people and on the system as well. Advocates say this trend exists across Canada and governments at all levels have been warned about the risks of doing too little for years. If we invest in things like preventive health, vaccine coverage and other initiatives to keep people healthy and well, we're going to be okay. However, if we don't, what we're going to see is our acute care system nearly broken. Daniel Clark knows just how difficult it can be to navigate the home care system. He says staff shortages and high demand made it nearly impossible to get his grandmother reliable care. With my grandma, there was, you know, certain days where there was supposed to be somewhere, someone there in the morning to help out and they weren't coming until, um, you know, later in the afternoon or there's some days where she was completely missed. So it was really difficult to be something that you could really like, depend on and, and rely on it. Home Care Ontario estimates the government needs to spend another $411 million a year over the next three years to beef up the system, or it says that an elderly tsunami will put even more strain on the health care system. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, an effort is underway to increase living kidney donations and transplants among racialized groups in Ontario. The project focuses on groups more prone to kidney disease because of greater rates of diabetes and high blood pressure. Doctors say some racialized patients don't ask their family and friends to donate a kidney because of cultural beliefs. Health Canada is funding the project that is also operating in B.C. A town in central Saskatchewan is mourning the loss of five people in a house fire. Two seniors and three children died in the community of Davidson. The blaze happened around noon yesterday. The RCMP says an 80-year-old man and an 81-year-old woman were pulled from the home and passed away in hospital. Once the fire was put out, crews discovered the remains of the children inside. No further details have been released. 
Canada is donating more than 800 drones to Ukraine. These drones are going to help Ukraine's frontline troops assess targets and threats quickly with accuracy and effectiveness. They have an automated and autonomous navigation system, and their rugged design makes it possible to carry different camera systems and payloads that can detect, recognize, identify, and acquire targets. The Sky Ranger aerial systems are built in Waterloo, Ontario, and are valued at over $95 million. The donation is funded by the $500 million in military assistance announced by the Prime Minister last year. Since February 2022, Canada has committed more than $9.7 billion in aid to Ukraine. There is growing global outrage over the prison death of Alexei Navalny, the Russian president's most vocal opponent. Navalny's widow accuses Vladimir Putin of poisoning her husband and vows to carry on his work. CTV's Joy Malbin reports. Alexei Navalny's widow vowing to continue her husband's fight for a free Russia. Using Navalny's old YouTube channel to accuse President Vladimir Putin of poisoning her husband and covering it up. They are hiding his body and lying, she says, waiting for the traces of Putin's Novichok to disappear. We will find out who committed this crime and name names and show faces. Navalny barely survived a poisoning three years ago. Critical of Putin, he inspired Russians to rise up. Imprisoned as an extremist, Navalny died suddenly at an Arctic penal colony in Siberia, just one day after joking and looking healthy during this court appearance. Navalny's mother in the black coat tried to see her son's body but was blocked from entering the morgue where she was told he would be. Told by the Kremlin, his body will be held for 14 days. In Moscow, Navalny's supporters call him a hero, continuing to lay flowers and tributes even after hundreds have been arrested. And across Europe, people are taking to the streets. In Washington, U.S. President Joe Biden blames Putin for Navalny's death, frustrated with House Republicans who refused to pass a military aid package for Ukraine's war against Russia. The way they're walking away from the threat of Russia, the way they're walking away from NATO, the way they're walking away from meeting our obligations, is, is, is just shocking. The White House says the U.S. is considering slapping additional sanctions on Russia, and the European Union is demanding an independent investigation into Navalny's sudden death. Joy Melbourne, CTV News, Washington. U.N. Security Council members are expected to vote tomorrow on an Arab-backed resolution demanding an immediate humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza. Today, the U.S. proposed an alternative resolution. The draft calls for a pause in the fighting as soon as practicable. It would require the release of all hostages being held in the territory and the lifting of all restrictions on the delivery of humanitarian aid. The U.S. resolution also opposes a major Israeli ground offensive in Rafah. Today, the European Union warned Israel about an incursion into the southern city. The consequences, potential consequences of such an operation at present time would be disastrous. There are more than a million people crammed in Rafah. It's not intended for a million people in shelters, in random uh, sort of uh, sheeted, plastic sheeted uh, constructions. Health conditions are very worrisome. The EU is also saying not enough aid is getting into the territory. 26 European Union countries called today for an immediate humanitarian pause that would lead to a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza. In The Hague, Palestinian representatives asked the U.N.'s highest court to declare Israel's occupation of their territory illegal. The United Nations enshrined in its charter the right of all peoples to self-determination and pledged to rid the world of the great, gravest breaches of this right, namely colonialism and apartheid. Yet, for decades... The Palestinian people have been denied this right and have endured both colonialism and apartheid. The request came at the opening of a week of hearings. They follow the UN General Assembly asking for a non-binding opinion on the occupation in 2022. Israel is not attending the hearings, but says an advisory opinion would be harmful to attempts to resolve the conflict because the questions posed by the UN General Assembly were prejudiced. 
Italy's prime minister will be in Toronto next month. It'll be Giorgia Maloney's first visit here since being elected in 2022. Justin Trudeau's office says the two leaders will discuss the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, as well as cooperation with African partners, among other issues. The pair got in a public spat last year after Trudeau criticized Italy's stance on LGBTQ2S plus issues in a meeting with Maloney at the G7 Leader Summit. One of the world's most popular tourist attractions has been forced to close its doors. Tourists were turned away from the Eiffel Tower because of a strike by workers at the site. They want pay increases ahead of the Summer Olympics. The union also says the owners are underestimating the cost of planned maintenance on the tower and the impact it will have on staff. Back here at home, it's been a milestone season for professional women's hockey. Last week's sold-out game at Scotiabank Arena setting records. And now a new exhibit at the Hockey Hall of Fame is showcasing the success. CTV Sean Lee Thong is live with more. Sean. Well, Nathan and Andrea, it's hard to believe the PWHL has only been in existence for a few short weeks, just starting on January 1st of this year. But now they've entered the Hockey Hall of Fame, and this league's profile is growing quickly. From the moment this puck was dropped for their first game, to when this goal was scored in front of 19,000 fans, the PWHL has been building a new reality, a reality where this is possible. Do you want to become a professional hockey player? Yes. Inside the Hockey Hall of Fame, items from the PWHL's inaugural game back on January 1st are located at the end of an exhibit celebrating the history of women's hockey. But today, history isn't what fans are talking about. It means like a, a future for a lot of young girls in sports, so that I played sports growing up, I didn't really have that kind of um, professional league to like look forward to in a sense. I feel pretty good about it because like I just knowing that there's a chance that I might be able to do it. Since the league played its first game on January 1st of this year, the future of the women's game seems brighter. Selling out arenas in Canada and the United States leading to a record-breaking crowd this past Saturday. <laughs> 19,285 fans selling out Scotiabank Arena in Toronto, the largest crowd ever to watch a women's game. Like right now, it still gives me goosebumps to even think of it. Um, it's a future for girls and women that they not only had heroes to look up to for the Olympics, but it's a possibility now that women can play professionally and get paid to play in an arena where men have only have always owned. It really just shows how much people like want to see them. It's really cool. The game in Toronto was one of three sellouts for the PWHL this weekend. Many inside the Hall of Fame talked about it as a much needed change to the hockey world. Because it's usually boys, but I'm happy to see girls. I think finally we're evolving in, in women's sports and women's hockey. Finally. <laughs> I think it's amazing. I think it's limitless. And I think if it can show people what's to come and build some energy and excitement around that, there's nothing but good things. And as the PWHL is sitting at the end of this line for women's hockey history, perhaps it's the beginning of a new chapter, one where they will take up a lot more space. And we see these pictures from Scotiabank Arena on Friday night. Much of the conversation today was about that huge crowd. Even though the league had been doing so well, people were surprised to see that large crowd, the large engagement, the sound inside. And now they're looking forward to the future. Reporting live, I'm Sean Lee Thong. Andrew, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Sean. The Toronto Maple Leafs kicked off a road trip today with a rare weekday afternoon game. With Krugin, Nylander takes that away. Maybe a break. William Nylander in with Holberg. Scores! <laughs> But the early start didn't seem to bother the Leafs. William Nylander scored the Leafs' third goal, and that was all they would need, beating the Blues in St. Louis 4-2. Toronto has won four straight and plays in Arizona on Wednesday. Speaking of Arizona, Austin Matthews, where he's from, has been named one of the NHL's three stars of the week. The Leaf center had hat tricks in back-to-back -back games and added two assists. His team won three straight games during the stretch. Matthews is now the 10th player in the NHL history to record six hat tricks in a season. Edmonton Oilers center Connor McDavid and Florida Panthers left wing Matthew Tuchuk are the other two stars of the week. Later on CTV News, whether it was lacing up the skates, strapping on the skis, or just spending precious time together. How people across Ontario are marking this family day.
And I'm Pat Foran coming up on Consumer Alert. When you take a flight, there is always a chance your luggage could go missing. A Brampton family says they had a suitcase get lost by an airline and it was carrying their brother's cremated ashes. I'll have that story. That's just ahead. When we're looking at conditions for skiing and snowboarding, they are good right now. It looks like many runs around, around and resorts around the region are reporting really solid bases. And we've had that colder weather, meaning it'll stick around. A little bit of a milder stretch this week, though. I'm going to tell you more about that coming up before we get back to wintry conditions. And stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. Welcome back. Whenever you take a flight, there's always a chance your checked luggage could go missing. But if it does, it's usually found. But a Brampton family says when one of their suitcases was lost, they never got it back. Mm. And it contained very precious cargo. Here's, Here's Pat Foran, sorry, oh, and no, consumer alert. Pat. Thanks, Nathan and Andrea. The family was taking their brother's cremated remains to Jamaica for a service. They put them in a checked suitcase, but when they arrived, the luggage was missing and it's never been recovered. It will be a miracle if we'll be able to get that luggage back. But we're still hoping. It was just over a year ago that Conroy Matthews died. His brother Charles says he still thinks about him almost every day. It was sad for me to lose him because we do everything together. And he like, was like my twin brother. Before Conroy passed, he had a final wish. He wanted his cremated ashes to be placed next to his mother's grave site in Jamaica. We should take some of his ash and put beside our mom. A group of family members flew to Jamaica for a memorial service last March, but when they arrived, the checked suitcase that contained their brother's remains had gone missing. Without Conroy's ashes, the service didn't happen. There was no body or more ashes for the service to take place. It was very, very sad, very depressing. Charles says he phoned the airport in Jamaica, went there several times and filled out a missing baggage form. When he returned to Canada the following month, he says he also contacted the airline Air Canada and was told when the suitcase was recovered, it would be sent to him. But it was never found. The luggage is missing and we've had no form of compensation or even kind words. In a statement to CTV News, the airline said it was very unfortunate, but said while the family informed the airport, it only learned of the lost suitcase three months after it went missing, so it was not possible to track the suitcase or provide compensation. Air Canada added, Cremated remains may be taken on board in your carry-on luggage, provided they are stored in a material that can be security screened. Charles feels he did provide Air Canada with the proper information and feels terrible he was not able to fulfill his brother's final wishes. We go to school together, we go to trade together, we have a cabinet shop together. It let me feel bad like I let him down with that. And while you can't take cremated ashes on an airplane, for international travel, there may be different rules depending on the country. You should check to see if additional paperwork may be required. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. It's a staple of winters in Canada, known around the globe. But the longest skating rink in the world, the Rideau Canal, is stumbling through this season. Barely open at all, so on this family day, a much-needed moment to celebrate. And people are taking full advantage. CTV's Sam Haup reports. It's been years since Violet Pyman has laced up and headed out on the Rideau Canal ice. But with the skateway open on family day, what better way to spend it than visiting her sister here in Ottawa? She's going to show me all her favorite parts of Ottawa, this being one of them. So, yeah, feeling great. Like her, many came out to the skateway Monday after the National Capital Commission flooded the ice to try and improve the conditions. Uh, I haven't been here since I was like 10-ish, so I'm just happy that it's open. Around two kilometres of ice were open to the public from Pretoria down to Bank. It's amazing. I'm so glad it's open. The ice conditions are perfect, but at least it's open. The recent warm weather has posed major challenges for canal maintenance crews. On Sunday, the canal opened for the first time during this year's Winterlude Festival, but was closed just hours later because of the snow. While ice conditions aren't ideal, they are improving. We're super excited. We yeah. actually weren't sure if we would even be able to skate because of the weather conditions. We heard that people were like walking the other days. It hasn't been open for a long time and pretty happy that it's, it's open. Good enough for me. 
That's all I care about. Winterlude may be wrapping up, but officials say they will try to keep the skateway open for as long as possible. We don't throw the towel at this point and we will give it the best we can. Sam Haupt, CTV News. I've been going to Ottawa for 50 years and I keep saying it's something I need to do or I want to do, but each time I go, conditions just aren't great. Yeah, and it's definitely been that way this winter, of course, with temperatures being on the milder side, although pretty chilly today in Ottawa and relatively chilly here as well. And because we had so much sunshine, it made it a pretty great family day for spending some time outdoors. So I hope you had the opportunity to get a little bit of that sunshine. And take a look at some milder temperatures ahead before we plummet into more wintry conditions. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. So we're sitting at minus three, feeling like minus eight right now, or minus seven, I should say, in the city of Toronto. And that's about as warm as it got today. Zero degrees in Windsor, though, and that is a bit of a sign of what's to come. A bit of a milder air mass starting to work its way in as we get into the next couple of days. And when I say mild, we're going to get possibly into the upper single digits as we get to the middle part of this week. But let's talk about what's happening right now before we get there. We've had a little bit more cloud cover work its way in. As we got into the afternoon, we started out with a little bit more sunshine. And we'll get, I would say, a little bit more clearing through the overnight. We'll lose some of this cloud. We do see a bit of enhancement off Georgian Bay. Uh, four areas in and around the Muskoka region, down towards the Barrie area. And even with these winds out of the west, seeing a little bit of activity along the shores of Lake Ontario, Toronto, extending into the Durham region. So if you're seeing flurries close to the lake shore, that's very likely why. Overnight tonight, as I mentioned, just a few cloudy periods, minus 9, feeling like minus 11. So this is really in the vicinity of our normals, really, throughout the region. A little bit more of a wind chill effect as we get further afield into northeast, eastern Ontario, I'd say up towards the Muskoka region, areas like Barrie, Midland, Aurelia. But not a lot to show you in terms of precipitation other than this lake enhancement until we get to the middle part of this week. Uh, tonight, we'll see that clearing. We stay with that as we get into tomorrow. Lots of sunshine on the way for us. And as I mentioned, milder temperatures, less wind. That's going to make things feel quite comfortable as we get into the day. So as we get into the morning, there's that clearing, more cloud cover off to the north and east of us. That stays with us until the evening. Really right into Wednesday, then we see the cloud cover start to build in for Wednesday. And then late Wednesday, we see the advancement of the showers with the system that's moving in from the west. It's far to the west of us right now behind the... the uh, the upper Great Lakes. So this stays with us into Thursday. We have showers into Thursday as well. And we stay mild. So tomorrow, three degrees, maybe feeling as cold as zero. Here's that milder point in our upper air pattern as we get midweek. And then as we get into Friday, you know, as we circle into much colder air. And this is how that plays out in the seven-day forecast. So three degrees tomorrow, minus two overnight. And mind you, we're starting around feeling around minus 11, minus 10 first thing in the morning. So do dress for that. Seven degrees for Wednesday, increasing clouds, showers Wednesday night and into Thursday. Seven degrees both of those days. Four degrees for Friday with a mix of sun and cloud. And then we plummet down to minus 12 Friday night into Saturday with the chance of flurries and stay colder for Saturday. And then rebound as we get past Saturday. Back to you, Nathan. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Straight ahead, that taxing feeling filing season is kicking off. The important dates and what else you need to keep in mind as you crunch the numbers this year. Ready, set, file. You can be forgiven for groaning, but it's officially tax time in Canada. Starting today, your income tax returns can be submitted online ahead of another date we all need to remember, April 30th. Here's CTV's Mike Lang. It's easy to dread and easy to put off tax season. But a taxing situation owner Rob Katzman strongly recommends preparing early. You want to avoid surprises. If you file your tax return at the beginning of March and you end up owing money, you've got two months to save up and pay your bill. And so that tax returns can be quickly reclaimed. It's your money. Don't you want it now? Katzman has been operating his Alliston office since 2017 and helped more than 2,000 clients last year. He says working with a reputable accountant can take a lot of stress out of tax season and that it's important to have a strong, trusting relationship with your tax handler. There are so many changes that happen from a year-to-year -year basis. Unless you're working in the industry, it's difficult to keep up with them. A lot of the changes may apply to you or may not. The first noticeable change this year, 2024 federal income tax bracket thresholds have shifted compared to those from 2023, 
but a significant change, especially with an aging community, all trusts that exceed $50,000 in value must be registered. It is for all trusts that are in existence, no matter when they were started. Most people don't even realize that they have a trust. Katzman says this will apply most commonly to parents who wish to co-sign their children's bank accounts and vice versa for adults who wish to manage their elderly parents' finances, as well as parents who co-sign a mortgage with their children to help them buy a property. Katzman warns that failing to register trusts could prove to be costly as penalties start at $10,000 and could be as high as 5% of a trust's value. Tax preparers could also be held accountable. If you have a trust situation and I don't ask you about it, I'm actually liable to a $2,500 fine. Katzman says the cost of registering a trust varies by case and that a trust return should be filed with the help of a professional. He also reminds those who are eligible to apply for a multi-generational home renovation tax credit and for potential new homeowners to open a first-time homeownership savings plan. Mike Lang, CTV News, Barry. Still ahead, content clampdown. Why TikTok is under formal investigation in Europe and what sanctions the social media giant could face. The thought of police officers who are paid to uphold public safety are in fact endangering public safety to the extent that they are speeding casually past speed cameras. That is, uh, that's not good. Updating our top stories calls for greater accountability over police officers caught speeding. Data obtained by CTV News shows more than a thousand automated tickets were issued to officers over a two-year period, with the number of tickets increasing from 2021 to 2022. We know the community is definitely alarmed, and, uh, and so are we, so we're doing our part in making sure they feel safe. A police command post has been set up in a North York neighborhood following two shootings over the weekend, including one which claimed a man's life. The other left a 16-year-old boy with life-threatening injuries. Police say they're still searching for a suspect in both incidents. We need to pay attention because these are the folks who will need so much care from the health care system. And any part of the care that is uh, higher than home care is very, very expensive. A new report is calling for the province to hire thousands more PSWs. It's all part of an effort to address the rising number of seniors in Ontario, a group that is growing more quickly than the general population. Well, more than 9,000 workers at Canada's two biggest railways could hit the picket lines in May. Contract negotiations have come to a halt in talks with the conductors and engineers, as well as yard workers. So the union representing workers at CN Railway Company and Canadian Pacific Kansas City Limited has asked Ottawa to appoint a conciliator. The move gives both sides 81 days to reach a deal before a potential work stoppage. The European Union has launched a formal investigation into TikTok. The EU wants to find out whether the company is doing enough to protect minors on its platform. The Commission will assess whether TikTok is complying with requirements for large social media platforms to mitigate the risk of users becoming addicted to their content. A number of governments around the world have expressed concerns about a potential security threat posed by TikTok, which is owned by China's ByteDance. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Talk about some picture-perfect conditions to enjoy this family day across southern Ontario. Fantastic to spend time outdoors and for many, a prime opportunity to hit the slope. CTV's Carol Charles spent the day at Dagmar. It was a welcome day on the slopes for many families who have been longing for the snow. We came out today, finally took advantage of the snow that came to Dagmar Resort. We live in the area, but we've never been here before, and it's great. I like going down the hill. How does it feel? It feels fun and scary at the same time. Jacob Friesen and his three daughters have been looking forward to this day. Family Day is important because it's a nice day off where you can enjoy time with each other and you can do whatever you want. And usually that calls for some speed. I love how we can go really fast. I like to weave through the poles, going in and out. You can go fast and feel the, the wind going at your face and all the snow. It feels amazing. And others a little more daring. 
Faith McCrail is into competitive snowboarding. She came out with her dad to practice. 360s, 180s, and jump stuff. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Over this weekend, more than 2,000 lift tickets and passes were sold. And staff are hoping to surpass that number today as we celebrate Family Day. Yeah, we're very excited to see all the young kids out with their parents and grandparents. We have close to 50 operational days this season and all 20 of our runs have been open since the middle of January. More outdoor fun could be found at Greenwood Park where adults and children alike laced up and took to the ice to enjoy time with their loved ones. Carol Charles, CTV News. And more great weather to enjoy some outdoor activities tomorrow. If you have the chance, lots of sunshine. A little milder, though. We'll be minus 9, feeling like minus 11 overnight. So cold to start, but then up to 3 degrees tomorrow. 7 for Wednesday and for Thursday. 4 degrees for Friday, but look at that minus 12 Friday night. You're chilly. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Raheem Ladani with our next local newscast at 11.30. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Michelle Jobin and all of us at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a good night. Good night.